A great general once prefaced his writings on the history of warfare with the comment, I have not written this book to glorify war. I have sought to highlight the human endeavor of men and women which is brought out in wartime. Montgomery of Alamein, 1968. So with this series, The Amazing World of War Machines, we shall not glorify war, but highlight the ingenuity and flexibility of the human mind in overcoming the theoretical and technical challenges of the times. The history of the machines of war, albeit the history of armed conflict, is intrinsically tied to the history of civilization and man's quest for the basics in life. From the dawn of time, people have endured conflict and in so doing discovered the value of technological advantage. The army most likely to be victorious on the battlefield would be the army with the edge in tactics, delivered by a technological advantage in weaponry. Time and again, the better bow and arrow won the day. The Assyrians had the battlefield superiority with their chariots, able to take advantage of the flat desert terrain. Defeated armies almost always learnt their lessons and, as a result, usually adopted the tactic or technology that had defeated them. This levelling of the battlefield would then lead to further breakthroughs in technology to regain the upper edge. In response to the chariot, the composite bow was perfected by the Egyptians. With its added strength and elasticity, it gave archers greater range and power. The Egyptians also eventually adopted the chariot. In defense of superior arrows, the Sumerians developed armor, cloaks studded with small circular metal pieces and larger shields, which the Romans used to create the phalanx. Methods to overcome the phalanx were explored and so on through the ages. One-upmanship was the name of the game of warfare and survival. Other stepping stones included the Roman gladius, or short sword, made from carbon steel. The English longbow, the trebuchet, and chain mail. But one technological development superseded all before it in one single stroke, or more appropriately, one single flash. Deep within the mists of mythology and forgotten history lies the origin of gunpowder, better known as black powder. Through the centuries, many scholars have tried to pinpoint the origins of this simple concoction of saltpeter, sulfur and charcoal. Many have laid claim from the Chinese to the Greeks, the Arabs to the Hindus. Pyrotechnical devices were certainly in use by the Chinese many centuries earlier. Ceremonial and religious fireworks were common. These concoctions of chemicals may well have included the black powder. The first official record of black powder appeared around 1260 AD in the writings of a Franciscan friar, Roger Bacon. The use of black powder at the time seems to have been restricted to pyrotechnic novelties and fireworks. The first weaponized use of the powder seems to have been the millimeter cannon, as described in the writings of Walter de Millimeter of England, dated 1326. Other records reveal that by this time gun and shot were, if not commonplace, well known. Illustrations of a soldier firing a handgun with a hot iron appear around 1400. Other depictions showed cannon and handgun side by side. The earliest existing samples of these handguns and cannon date back to around this time. These simple crude weapons were often heavily decorated. They generally consisted of a wooden stave or rod up to three feet long and an iron or bronze cast barrel attached with iron bands. 
The barrel varied from one to three feet with a smooth bore. The so-called caliber of these early weapons varied from half an inch to one and a half inches. Some of these devices seem to have been cast as a hollow tube, then one end was plugged to form the chamber, a vent or flash hole was then drilled through the metal at one end. Powder was introduced into the barrel followed by shot or stones or other projectiles. Powder was then added to the outer vent or flash hole and whilst the gun was held and aimed with the wooden stave, hot iron was applied to the priming powder in the vent. It was ignited and flashed down through the hole into the chamber, igniting the main charge, thus firing the shot. With slight variations including hooks and handles, these hand guns were used whilst on horseback, from wagon or parapet. Bracing the handgun against a solid object with the hook lessened the recoil the shooter suffered. The Hakenbuchse, from the old German word for hook, Haken, gradually changed over time to Harquibus or Arquibus. Obviously, in the field of battle, many factors affected a soldier wielding a handgun. The wind, rain, riding on horseback, watching where he placed the match to fire the gun, and so on. A more effective method of triggering the gun was sought. The early attempts involved a metal lever attached to the barrel that lowered a burning piece of rope into the priming powder. This was quickly developed by impregnating a loosely woven hemp cord with saltpeter to create a slow match. Once ignited, the cord would smolder very slowly and reliably. A few feet of this match would last several hours on the battlefield and provided a consistent ignition source. The ignition point was improved as well. The vent or flash hole was moved to the side of the barrel and shaped into a pan or saucer which could be filled with powder. The mechanism to lower the burning match into the pan was soon refined as well. Originally a serpentine lever held the match and was lowered into firing position with a lever. Over many years, this system was refined by gunsmiths to improve reliability and production. Soon the serpentine and pan were combined into one unit called a lock, attached to a lock plate and to the side of the barrel. Another major improvement was the addition of a cover placed over the pan. It could slide open to allow a priming charge to be placed into the pan, then closed to keep it in place and dry, ready to fire. It was then slid open to allow for the match to ignite it. More terms entered the common language. A flash in the pan, meaning a failed ignition of the main charge or failure to go off. Also lock, stock and barrel to identify all the parts of a firearm. Another improvement was the snapping match lock. The serpentine was made smaller and spring-loaded. A separate trigger lever released the mechanism for firing. This allowed the gunner to pay more attention to his target. The stock soon evolved and flattened out to be held against the shoulder, one hand on the butt, the other on the stock, giving support and improving accuracy. The musketeer soon became more accurate, hence more formidable on the battlefield. This simple and sometimes effective machine remained in use for over a hundred years. The 16th century brought with it a renewed interest in improving the technology. The next stage was to remove the smoldering match and replace it with a better ignition source. The wheel lock is basically an old-fashioned cigarette lighter. In it, a serrated wheel would spin rapidly, held against a flint stone. The resulting shower of sparks would be directed into the pan full of priming powder and ignited. The origins of this design breakthrough are also shrouded in mystery, although Leonardo da Vinci did make several drawings of such a device. However, a clockmaker from Nuremberg was the more likely candidate. The wheel lock required a spring attached to the axle. 
With a key or spanner, the wheel is rotated, applying tension to the spring. A locking pin held the wheel from spinning back. The serpentine lever and glowing match was replaced with a cock, a smaller metal lever with jaws tightly gripping a piece of pyrite or flint. A spring held the cock in one of two positions. When ready to fire, the pan cover was opened, the cock was flung to its firing position, the jaws holding the pyrite hard against the wheel, and the trigger actuated to release the spinning wheel, the sparks flying into the pan and igniting the charge. Among the advantages, it stopped patrols and guardsmen being seen at night walking about with a glowing lit match. The wheel lock, however, suffered from its complexity, inasmuch as it was expensive to manufacture. Instead of equipping an army, the wheel lock was marketed more towards hunters and wealthy landowners. The next evolution of small arms came from market pressures more than any other reason. Ever in search of new markets, gunmakers looked to other, simpler methods of ignition to satisfy an army's requirements and hence large volume sales. Once again, the originality of the snaphorns is in debate, but German gunsmiths are the most likely. The word snaphorns means snapping hammer, which is the principle behind this new development. Though there are some variants in design, the basic theory behind the snaphorns is based on the careful placement of the individual components of the lock. The cock, with its jaws gripping the flint, was now spring-loaded. Held in the cocked position with a cross bolt or sear that was actuated by a separate trigger lever. Attached to the frizzen was a concave steel lip tilted up towards the cock. On firing, the cock, under spring tension, would fly forward, striking the frizzen's curved steel surface with the flint, creating a shower of sparks. With the interplay of forces, the frizzen is then swung up and out of the way as the sparks enter the pan, igniting the priming charge. Hence, flint and steel entered the common vernacular. Seventeenth-century French gunsmiths finally began taking the elemental parts of the snap horns and developed the true flintlock. To define a flintlock from a snap horns, the frizzen pan cover is one unit held in position with a strong spring. The cock has attached at its axis a tumbler. Acted upon by a sear, it has two positions, half and full cock, and all the mechanisms are hidden behind the lock plate. The flint lock was an immediate success, and because it was efficient, cost-effective and easy to use, was adopted by most armies. The flint lock saw its way onto most weapon systems like cannon, musket and pistol. Another innovation about the same time, and probably brought about to standardize the infantry, was the cartouche. A prepared cartridge, a paper container with a set quantity of black powder and a projectile. The method of use was this. Bring the gun into priming position, tear open the cartouche with the teeth, and sprinkle a small amount of powder into the frizzen pan. Close the pan and rest the gun on its buttstock, sprinkle the rest of the powder charge into the barrel, then place the remaining package, which acted as wadding, and the projectile into the barrel, ramming it home with the ramrod. The gun is now ready to cock, aim, and fire. Of course, with everyone armed with the same weapon, the technology edge seemed to come down to the type and quality of pyrite or flint and the quality of the powder. A good quality flint should last 50 firings before being discarded and a new one put in its place. The powder? Fast and clean burning as possible, although black powder was notorious for leaving a corrosive residue. However, there was always one drawback with the flintlock. It was not true instantaneous firing. In fact, there was quite a time lag from when the trigger was squeezed, the cock fell, igniting the pan powder, and then the main charge exploded and discharged the shot.
there were two major effects of this primer flashing moments before the gun fires. One, the untrained musketeer would flinch and put his aim off. Or when hunting, the shooter alerted the game to the impending shot and it would flee unharmed. A good soldier would learn not to flinch and hold his aim true, and the hunter would learn to predict the actions of his game. Reverend Alexander James Forsyth was a keen chemist and shooter, and applied his talent towards solving the delayed firing problem of the flintlock. Earlier in 1800, Edward Howard had discovered an explosive compound, fulminate of mercury, a substance that when hit or struck would detonate violently. Forsyth began making his own experiments and developed an exploding powder made largely of potassium chlorate. He then set about developing a lock to utilize this new explosive. The Forsyth lock, or scent bottle lock, because of its resemblance to such, consisted of a small revolving magazine or flask of his new powder. The cock had its jaws and flint removed and replaced with a simple hammer. The gun is loaded the usual way with black powder and shot. Then the magazine is rotated a half revolution, bringing the flask into alignment with the vent. A small amount of the powder would drop down under gravity and charge the vent hole. The magazine was then returned to its original position, where the mechanism held a loose pin above the vent and powder. On squeezing the trigger, the hammer fell, striking the pin, which entered the vent and crushed the powder. It dutifully detonated, igniting the full charge in the chamber almost instantaneously. Forsyth's lock drew much interest and had some commercial success. The complexity of the device prevented it from being adopted for wider military use. However, it is Forsyth's invention that became the pivotal point of small arms development, the watershed moment. Before, it had taken many hundreds of years to see the technology slowly creep forward. After his percussion firing mechanism had shown the way, weapon development steamed ahead. Percussion caps, metal cartridges, breech loading and rapid fire mechanisms. And by 1900, there remained very little more development to be done for the modern firearm. Forsyth's lock was seized upon by gun manufacturers everywhere and rapid improvements and variants emerged. Forsyth and Purdy, his business partner, introduced their own improvements, including a sliding magazine linked to the hammer. The loose detonating powder had its drawbacks and varnished covered pills of powder were introduced, as too were pinches of powder sealed between two paper discs. That design still survives today in children's cap guns. From there, paper and material tapes of powder packets would be placed across the vent, then struck with a pin. One ingenious method was placing the powder in a small sealed tube of copper. The open end thrust onto the vent, then crushed by the falling hammer. This led to the next major step, the percussion cap. A small brass top hat coated inside with the explosive powder was then sealed with varnish the vent becoming a hollow nipple, which the cap was placed over, then crushed with the falling hammer. Once again, great ideas are never orphans. There were several claimants to this breakthrough, and patents were taken out in several countries, including France, Britain, and America. One minor cause for concern was when the cap would split on detonation, possibly harming the firer. This was quickly resolved with the hammer being hollowed out, so at the time of detonation, the cap was surrounded with the hammer head. Armies around the world had invested heavily in the flintlock, and by fortune's way, the percussion cap lock could quickly and easily replace the older flintlock. The conversion was lightning fast, and the military forces remained at the peak of the technological pyramid.
During the ignition development, other advances were made in loading the weapon. Examples of the breech-loading rifle go back to the times of the match lock and wheel lock. This method of reloading would be advantageous in confined spaces or on horseback. A fine example of breech-loaded carbines and shield pistols belonged to Henry VIII. Other examples of breech loading were developed for the flintlock, including this ingenious loading method. Shot in one tube and powder in another, both in the butt stock. With the aid of gravity and the turning of a lever, a rotating chamber would deliver first a shot to the barrel breech, then a load of powder. The flintlock revolver was one of many attempts to improve the number of shots one could perform in a minute. One idea was to supply multiple barrels. Several examples of multi-barreled flintlocks exist, including the duck's foot pistol, Knox volley gun, a seven-barreled short musket, pepper box. In 1818, one Captain Artemis Wheeler of Concord, Massachusetts, took out a patent of a seven-shot pistol. It was actually a carbine or musket with a hand-turned cylinder and fired with a flintlock. Wheeler's assistant, Elisha Collier, moved to England and took out his own patent for a repeating firearm. This one had the advantage of a spring to rotate the chambers and another spring to move the chamber forward to lock in place against the barrel, so sealing in the hot gases. The pepper box pistol took the advantages of the percussion cap and a self-cocking mechanism that automatically revolved the barrels and placed them in alignment with hammer and barrel by simply pulling the trigger to become a popular weapon. At the Great Exposition of 1851 in London, one Samuel Colt showed off his wares. First patented in 1835 in America, his mechanical revolver used a similar mechanism to the pepper box to rotate and align the cylinders. There was little interest in revolvers in Europe at the time. It took the advent of the American-Mexican War and subsequent gold rush to see Sam Colt's gun come into popular use. His first model was an open frame type. The hammer mechanism was housed in the butt of the frame along with the cylinders and rotating ratchet mechanism. The barrel attached with a key or wedge to load the cylinders required disassembling the revolver. A later version, the Navy revolver, had a levered rammer placed under the barrel. So loading of shot and powder did not require complete disassembly. Colt's patent on the ratchet mechanism held back most other competition for revolver design until it ran out in 1857. Colt's only real competition was English gunsmith Robert Adams with his closed frame revolver and the auto cocking mechanism. By pulling the trigger, the hammer would rise and fire in one motion. Colt's revolver was single action, requiring the shooter to cock the hammer manually. Both types had their advantages. 
Both Colt and Adams competed for military contracts, and Colt usually won out due to the increased accuracy of a single-action revolver. However, when a Lieutenant Beaumont made a modification to the Adams revolver, allowing for both single and double action, it quickly replaced the Colt in service with the British military. With the advent of the modern cartridge ammunition revolver, designers had to contend with the problems of loading and unloading the chambers. Many designs and gizmos were created for this function. In the end, there were only three functional types. As with Colt's Peacemaker model, the cylinders remained fixed, but a gate at the side of the frame allowed access to each cylinder one at a time. The lever drammer was redesigned and rotated around the barrel to align with this gate. The lever ram would then push the spent casing out of the cylinder. The second mechanism, the hinged frame where the frame opened, the barrel and cylinder kept together to expose the rear face of the cylinders for loading, an ejector pin would press upon a plate in the rear of the chambers, catching the lip of the cartridge and so ejecting all chambers at once. The third and most popular was the solid frame side opening model. Where the cylinders would swing out on an arm, allowing for rapid loading and unloading of all the cylinders at once. With few exceptions, like the Webley Fosbury automatic revolver, the design of revolvers was settled by 1890, and any future development would simply be tinkering around the edges. The automatic pistol, or more accurately, the self-loading pistol, could not come about until the invention of cartridge ammunition. After Maxim demonstrated how the gas from a spent cartridge could be channeled to actuate a mechanism or recoil used to supply mechanical power to cycle a mechanism, it was no mean feat to apply these principles to handguns. The automatic pistol that relied on cased ammunition would also suffer from inconsistent or irregular ammunition, not only in size and shape, but propellant type and load. Manufacturing of high-quality parts for pistols was also a concern, and both early gun and ammunition were unreliable. The first use of spent gas to actuate the hammer of a revolver and in turn rotate and align the cylinders came about as early as 1885 in England and 1863 in Spain. Except for the Webley Fosbury automatic revolver, few attempts at automating revolvers were successful. Engineers turned to a new design method utilizing a bolt action, then popular with military rifles. Early self-loading models included the Mauser and Riger repeaters. The Riger repeating pistol required the user to insert an index finger into a ring attachment placed where the trigger would normally reside. Then, with manual action, push the ring forward to open the bolt, and a pulling action to move the bolt forward, taking a fresh round from a magazine and closing the bolt with the round fully seated in the breech. Then a firing pin strikes the round, discharging the weapon. A very complex mechanical action that, when the gun was dirty or dry, required a lot of effort to operate. But it was this type of design that moved forward. The Schoenberger pistol had the ammunition modified, so after firing, the primer cap was forced back so as to unlock the breech, and the remaining recoil energy forced the cartridge back and opened the bolt. Because of the need for specialized ammunition, this method soon fell by the wayside. 
The Borchardt was the first real automatic pistol available commercially and the first to use a box magazine. It was recoil operated with a locking bolt similar to what Maxim used on his weapons. Developed and patented by Hugo Borchardt in 1893 whilst living in Connecticut in the United States, he couldn't find financial backing and so moved back to his native country of Germany where his design was manufactured in Berlin by the Ludwig Löwe company. The Luger, a refinement of the Borchardt mechanism, became a very successful design with several variants. The most common model was the 08 version with the standard short 10 cm barrel, the naval model 14 cm barrel, and the artillery 19 cm barrel. The Luger artillery version with adjustable sights also came with a large capacity snail drum magazine and attachable butt stock. Peter Paul Mauser was a brilliant gun designer who produced many significant firearms. There is some dispute as to the true origins of the Mauser automatic pistol. Some say it was the factory superintendent, a man by the name of Federley, who was responsible. However, the design was completed in 1893 and put into production in 1896. The Mauser became known as the broom handle and was one of the most successful automatics. With a caliber of 7.63 millimeters, it was distinguished by the box magazine holding 10 rounds placed before the trigger. Eventually made in several calibers, the original version failed to find military service until World War I, when the gun was made in the smaller 9mm caliber for the German army. After the war, restrictions on arms manufacturing hindered further development until permitted to manufacture a new short barrel version for the Russians. This model was referred to as the Bolo. In the United States, automatic pistol design was rare due to the plethora of revolvers available. John Moses Browning studied the problem and developed some small, low-powered pocket pistols. With little interest from the US, he sold the design to a Belgian company that would go on to great success with his designs. Browning went back to the drawing board and eventually came back with a simple but robust design for a locked breech mechanism that showed itself as the Colt .45 M1911. The Colt 45 would become the longest serving and most successful large caliber pistol design in the world. And with the reliability and heavy caliber, it was rapidly adopted by the US military forces. Meanwhile, Spain, utilizing Browning's earlier designs, became the powerhouse of design and production for Europe. The French and Italian governments ordered large contracts for 7.65 mm automatic pistols, and dozens of small companies sprang up to meet the demand. After the First World War, these companies continued to manufacture Ibor automatics named after the Spanish territory that was the center of arms manufacturing. The poor quality of design and material used in some of these companies led to a decline in the demand for Spanish-made arms. It would take many years for the Spanish to counter this trend. Other designs of note include the German Walter pistol that conquered the double action requirement. An automatic pistol could only be carried either loaded and hammer cocked with safety on, or with an empty breech and hammer down, requiring additional effort to ready to fire from the holster. Walter enabled pistols to be cocked and then drop the hammer with a safety. The trigger need only be squeezed to raise the hammer to the cocked position, then released to fire around. 
The Walther P-38 was adopted by the German army in 1937. French designer Charles Péter made modifications to Browning's locked breech and produced a pistol for the French army. His design patent was purchased sometime later by the Swiss and modified to produce the SIG line of pistols. The Japanese introduced their own homegrown revolver design in 1893 the Meiji 9mm 26 Nenkenju. Although it did have several mechanical traits identical to other overseas models. They also produced an 8mm self-loading pistol. The Taisho Model 04, designed by Kijiro Nambu, though not officially accepted as an officer's sidearm, was very popular with them nonetheless. It was also chambered for various calibers, including 7mm. The later Model 14, introduced in 1925, saw action in Manchuria. After which it was modified once more in 1937, with lessons learned in the field. Unfortunately for Japanese officers, the Model 94 was also introduced during wartime. Production standards slipped and the weapon became hazardous to operate. Browning made improvements to his 1911 design which evolved into the Browning High Power Pistol. Again, another very popular weapon. Once again, apart from fiddling with the details, the basic automatic pistol design was set by the late 1930s. Pistol designs and manufacturers proliferated throughout Europe and other countries, ever improving designs. Germany began to rearm and was one of the few military organizations to look to new pistol designs. As mentioned, the German military officially adopted the Walter P38. Other Walter designs, the PP appeared in several calibers and the small but venerable PPK also saw military service. The Belgian FN model 1910 remained in service during the Second World War and was produced for Luftwaffe crews. The Polish VIS service pistol was also adopted by the Waffen SS through till 1944. The British Webley of .455 calibre, used during the First World War, was improved. The Mark IV led to the Enfield No. 2 Mark I revolver, which was chambered for .38 Smith & Wesson, and was widely used amongst Commonwealth forces. The Beretta Modello 1934, a fine compact pistol, was taken up as the Italian service pistol and grew to become a popular collector's item. Browning's HP 9mm pistol continued to be produced during the war. The Canadians also produced this weapon and a re-engineered version called the Ingalls High Power. The Czechoslovakian arms manufacturer produced the CZ VZ38. It served with their military forces, but ultimately was unsuccessful. The United States retained the Colt M1911A1 in 45 ACP as their standard sidearm until late in the 20th century. Soviet forces utilized Browning's successful design to produce the Tokar FTT-33 as their standard pistol, replacing the Rera TT-30. It was more ruggedly designed, manufacture under license extended to many other countries, including China. Later in the 20th century, several European arms manufacturers became leaders in their marketplaces. While names like Sig, Heckler & Koch, Browning, Colt and Smith & Wesson retained their market share. 
Other nations like South Africa and Israel were forced to develop their own arms industries. Today, modern military sidearms are not dissimilar in nature, but perhaps in brand name. The United States eventually dropped the Colt 45 for the Beretta 94 model, a high-capacity 9mm weapon. That and the newer .40 inch being the dominant calibers. Manufacturers Glock, Heckler & Koch, Sigzauer and CZ, Smith & Wesson all offer semi-auto models in common calibers. All these models are manufactured to high standards and with modern ammunition they seldom jam or misfire. Properly maintained, they all have a long operational lifespan. The future of these weapons seems secure. Other areas of improvement will not be an engineering matter, but perhaps involve advanced electronics for safety or biometrics, so a sidearm can be keyed to just one person. The gun will not function for anyone else. Video camera and other targeting electronics are already in use. Perhaps caseless ammunition or guided projectiles will be the next breakthrough in small arms. This next category of war machine is also one utilized by individual soldiers. And as the musketeers were named after their mechanical device, so too were the grenadiers, the ones that lob grenades. Throwing small explosive devices at the enemy seems to have originated soon after the invention of black powder. Chinese forces made small pots or metal containers full of the explosive mixture and packed with sharp metal fragments and threw them from the parapets of the Great Wall against the attacking armies of the north. Technically, a grenade is a small explosive device that is thrown by hand. The word grenade comes from the French for pomegranate, which early grenades resembled. It can consist of an explosive, gas or chemical bomb. It is a short-range weapon and subcategorized as offensive or defensive. As a defensive weapon, it is used whilst the thrower has immediate cover to protect himself from the blast, hence usually thrown from a defensive position. These devices are usually more powerful and incorporate a fragmentation casing. The offensive grenade is thrown ahead of an advance. Usually less powerful, they are used for room clearing and are limited in effective range. One variant of an offensive type is the modern stun grenade, tossed into a confined space preceding troops storming into the room. Grenades were first used in the West around the 15th century and consisted of hollow iron balls filled with black powder and ignited with a slow-burning fuse. For effective use, the biggest or strongest troopers were used so they could throw the bomb far enough away from themselves and their front lines to avoid being injured by their own weapon. They had also to be of tougher fortitude, for at times they had to stand out in front of their own forces, an obvious target, waiting for their fuse to burn down to the point where they could throw the bomb without it being picked up and tossed back by an enemy. It was King Louis XIV who officially created the role of grenadier soldier. Being of larger stature and bold in action, they quickly became an elite guard. Their equipment and clothing was also modified to accommodate their specialist mission. They had slings attached to their muskets so they could throw their gun over their shoulder. A smaller hat or cap was provided for them to accomplish this more easily. With two free hands, they could effectively light and throw their grenades. By the beginning of the 19th century, the hand grenade had all but disappeared from use, 
until the 20th century, when it was rekindled during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904, where trench warfare first reared its ugly head. The grenade became an effective trench clearing weapon. By the time the First World War had bogged down into a trenched stalemate, Britain had few grenades stockpiled and hurriedly began developing new types. The first was grenade number one. It consisted of a canister of cast iron attached to a stick 18 inches long. These turned out to be just as dangerous to the user as the proposed receiver. Improvised grenades made from jam tins packed with gun cotton or TNT appeared amongst Australian forces. These were called appropriately jam tin bombs. The first serious grenade was devised by English inventor William Mills in 1915. The Mills bomb, as it became known, weighed about 0.56 kilograms and consisted of a perforated cast iron casing that would split in numerous fragments when detonated. The casing was filled with high explosive TNT flakes. Down the center of the bomb was placed the striker and timing fuse connected to a detonator placed to one side in the explosive material. The striker was spring-loaded and held in place by a safety lever or spoon that lay against the outside body. This was kept in place with a split pin and ring. The grenadier would hold the bomb tightly in one hand and with the other remove the safety pin. He would then lob the bomb like a cricket ball with an extended arm motion. Once leaving the thrower's grip, the safety lever would spring away, releasing the striker, which would ignite a primer cap, and the delayed chemical fuse would burn for four seconds, then trigger the detonator and the main charge. There were other types of British grenade, but the Mills bomb was the most popular. By the end of the First World War, over 33 million had been thrown by British and Commonwealth forces. Two other notable types of grenade were also produced by German and French forces. The French pineapple grenade had an impact fuse that would detonate on hitting the ground. The German stick grenade, or Steilhandgranate Schnittmodell, consisted of a hollow wooden handle about 10 inches long attached to a metal canister at one end. At the other end of the stick, a cap is unscrewed to expose a string which, when pulled, activates the fuse. The stick aided greatly in throwing the grenade some distance. In trench clearing, several grenade canisters could be bound together around one stick and thrown into a trench for effect. During the Second World War, more examples of effective designs appeared. The Russian hand grenade operated the same way as the Mills bomb, but had the striker assembly outside the main body permitting more explosive charge to be packed in. The United States' iconic pineapple grenade was an effective defensive weapon. The striker mechanism exchanged the tubular striker and spring for a hinged design. Once the pin was removed and the grenade tossed, the safety lever was jettisoned by the spring-loaded hinged striker. One should note that the habit of GI soldiers to dangle their grenades from their pockets by the safety lever was quickly discovered to be hazardous. Not only could the safety pin be snagged and accidentally pulled, but the weight of the dangling grenade could warp the shape of the lever, in some reported cases enough to cause the striker underneath to be released and activate the grenade. Another development during the First World War was to fit the Mills bomb with a plate and shaft at the base. This was then inserted into the barrel of a Lee Enfield rifle and a blank round loaded. The gun was aimed and fired. The escaping gases would lob the grenade up to 60 feet. Repeated use of the rod resulted in damage to the rifle barrel, so other mechanisms were devised, such as a cup attachment fitted to the barrel. These two used the escaping gases of a blank round to propel the grenade some distance. One French design used live ammunition to launch and activate the grenade. The bullet would pass through a hole in the center of the grenade and trigger the fuse with an electrical connection. The escaping gases would then propel the grenade upwards. High tolerances of manufacture were needed for this less successful version. Today, hand grenades come in a variety of canister or spherical shapes, but retain the same basic firing mechanism. 
Weapons designed to fire just grenades did appear as early as the 19th century and have been carried through to the modern arms era. With models like the US M79 grenade launcher that fired a 40 mm grenade up to a maximum range of 400 meters. It found some popularity amongst US forces in the Vietnam War. The common design in more recent times is to include a grenade launcher with the modern assault rifle. The US M16 and Soviet Kalashnikov standard infantry weapon both have a grenade launcher designed to be slung under the rifle barrel and actuated by a separate trigger housing. It is another war machine that improves the firepower of a single combat soldier.